Okay, so let's talk about the respiratory system. So the assessment of the overall respiratory system involves the um, sorry, it involves a lot more than cytology most often, and typically cytology is done after, depending where, but typically it's done after x-rays, sometimes after or in combination with endoscopy, but it also could include otoscopy, and of course there's always gross examination, so that's the initial first step is gross examination. But it's really important to know that cytology in general is one of many steps in investigating the respiratory system. And if you hear a gentle purring in the background, that's just my cat, Piper. So the nose is the starter, and we'll look at some of the, the reasonings behind sampling the nose and then some of the common findings that we might find when sampling the nose for cytology. Looks like the happiest cow ever. So a brief overview of the anatomy of the nose. We've got the ventral and dorsal concave, the nasal cavity, and then of course it meets up through the pharynx here with the oral cavity. And with some of our testing, um, we'll talk about getting pharyngeal um, what word am I thinking of here? Contamination. So contamination from the pharynx in our cytology findings. Indications that we might need to think about sampling the nose, and it would be the vet who's, of course, uh, telling us to sample the nose, and the, it would be the doctor who's telling us which type of sampling would need to be done, and most often it's the doctor who's doing the sampling themselves, and then, of course, we're there to take the sample and run it and review it. So if the animal comes in with nasal discharge, if they have discomfort, so they might be pawing at their nose, or sometimes they're sneezing a lot. That's really common if there's something going on with their nose that they're sneezing. If they have change in breath, that should say breath, breath sounds. So maybe if they have a whistle that won't go away, or a gurgling sound, or a snore that's all of a sudden started. And then of course if there are any visible masses or lesions on or around the nose. So of course the first one, discharge, common indication that there could be something going on with the nasal passage. The other reason that animals commonly get um, nasal discharge is cats often get it if they're upper respiratory cats. Dogs can get it if, if they have something lodged in their nose, if they have a little foreign body. <coughs> Excuse me. But either way, we wouldn't want to ignore purulent discharge that looks like that. If they have mucoid or mucopurulent discharge, again, we wouldn't be ignoring that. And then, of course, if they have hemorrhagic discharge, that's really important too. So the first two, definitely, they could indicate that something is blocking the nasal passage and it's sort of getting, um, it's getting a little bit stuffed up with foreign material that can't get through, that can't get pushed back into the nose or back out into the outside world. So maybe you start getting accumulation of bacteria, of inflammatory cells. Hemorrhagic discharge, of course, the doctor is going to want to find out what's causing that because that definitely could be a tumor itself or an active bleed, as well as other things um, like trauma, etc., that could cause a hemorrhagic discharge from the nose. Serous discharge, so this one's hard to see, but serous discharge is just that nice clear discharge. It's pretty normal for dogs, at least, cats. It's not overly normal unless they are purring significantly. So if a cat's really happy and purring quite a bit, then often they'll start dripping uh, from their nose or from their mouth. They'll either start drooling or dripping serous discharge. So otherwise, if cats have copious amounts of serous discharge and they're not purring, <clears throat> then it might be something that the doctor would want to investigate. And same with a dog. It's going to depend on the amount. So if it's above the average amount for that animal, then yeah, the doctor will very likely want to sample it. And then of course, if there's any obvious tumors or lesions present. So this is a little dog. This was in Peru. And this was before I really knew a lot about the transmissible venereal tumor on dogs. But it's really, really common in the southern parts of North America and Central or um, South America as well to get this transmissible venereal tumor. And it's a tumor that is transferred from the genitalia of an animal onto their face and it's and back and forth and back and forth. And technically it's a cancer, which is really weird that it's a transmissible cancer. And it's essentially the oldest cancer in the world. So it's a really, really cool, really unique 
um, condition, but it's also really, really horrible for animals that get it. And it essentially just eats away at either their genitals or at their face until they get chemo and they get medication for it. <coughs> so this little guy here, you can see from afar, it doesn't look too bad. So he's just got the starting of transmissible venereal tumor right through there. And that's a, an open lesion, like an erosive lesion that eventually will eat away and grow quite significantly large. And of course, just throwing it out there in areas where they have a lot of unneutered, unspayed roaming dogs, you're going to see huge increases in this specific illness happening because those dogs, because they're roaming and they are intact, they're going to be continuously sniffing each other looking for a mate. So then, of course, they're continuously spreading that disease. Here's another example of a tumor. This one was neat because A, the dog looks like a cartoon, which is kind of funny but not funny. Um, B, it's benign, so that's really good news. And C, my parents' dog, Fergie, had this thing happen to her as well. So she was a, she is still a Beagle Cocker Spaniel cross, and she had this nose that all of a sudden it came on. My parents, you know, of course, they thought it was diet. They thought it was chicken that she was allergic to. They started changing her meals, and she had this huge very firm growth on her nose that made her look like this ridiculous cartoon dog, which is really unfortunate. So we brought her to work and the vet and I uh, sedated her. She was fabulous. And we did a punch biopsy of that growth. So we took a sample, sent it away for histopathology. I didn't even do any cytology in-house at that time. I just wanted to get it all sent away and get the true professionals to look at it. And it turns out that it was a histiocytosis, so it's a form of a histiocytic lesion, which we'll talk about when we talk about neoplasia. But it's a benign tumor, and oddly enough, um, so they do come and go, that's one thing, that they can increase in size and decrease in size here and there. And oddly enough, as soon as we did the punch biopsy, I kid you not, we cured that thing with a punch biopsy. Because within a few weeks, it was gone, and it didn't ever, ever come back. It was really weird. It's going on like eight years now and it's never come back. So really weird, weird findings and really a strange occurrence and then disappearance of it. But you might see something like that. So again, you know, cytology is not everything. Gross examinations where we start and then we did x-rays on her as well to see if there was any bone involvement. So cytology is a piece of the puzzle when investigating nasal conditions and the respiratory tract in general. <clears throat> sample collection and preparation. It's going to depend on what it is that you're sampling. <coughs> I'm always, always coughing when I'm doing these lectures, by the way. My apologies. So if it's a biop, uh, we'd biopsy if it was a visible mass, like that one I was just telling you about. We might do a fine needle aspirate, fine needle biopsy for visible masses. We might do a nasal flush or a nasal lavage for getting internal, um, some cellular material from inside the na nasal cavity. We can use swabs. A lot of times swabs might be helpful on the very initial presentation just to see if there's anything obvious. But we always have to remember that if we are just swabbing the discharge, it might just be secondary to what's actually going on inside the nasal cavity. So the discharge might be secondary inflammation because there's a tumor blocking the way inside the nasal passage. And then of course we're going to use the smear techniques, so the slide preparation techniques established. And of course we're going to select the best one for the consistency of the material that we're handling. So looking at cytology, you'd expect to see epithelial cells, so typical squamous from the nares, bacteria on the squamous, really common to get bacteria in the nasal passage because that's its goal is to uh, block, to block the bacteria from entering in. Basal epithelials, so those are those little baby epithelials, the really young ones. And then ciliated columnar epithelials, and we'll talk about those. So the ciliated columnar epithelials are specific to the upper respiratory tract, and they are beautiful epithelial cells with really nice nuclei, but then they have this really cool fringe border on one end of their cytoplasm. So that little fringe border, and I'll point to it once we get there, that's really what's used to propel bacteria, propel dirt, uh, and keep mucus 
pumping as well, or keep mucus, sorry, sitting on top. But the, that's a, a defense in keeping foreign material and bacteria out of the body, those little ciliated, that little brush border. You may also see neutrophils. It's not ideal to see neutrophils. That's telling us that there could be infection, but more so inflammation. That truly should say inflammation. Red blood cells might be contamination from collection, or it could indicate that something is actively bleeding. We might be on the lookout for infectious agents like fungus or bacteria. And then, of course, looking for foreign bodies, that's more of a gross examination. So when the doctor is using the scope inside the nose, they're going to look for any foreign material that has gotten stuck up there. And then anytime we're doing cytology, we always want to keep an eye out for neoplastic cells. And we'll talk about that later in the lecture series. But changes to normal cells uh, that start indicating that there might be some abnormal mitosis or abnormal pro proliferation of those cells, um, mostly in the, in the nuclear changes. So these are the happy little, I think they're happy, I don't know why I think they're happy, the ciliated columnar epithelial cells. So you can see here, again, round purple nucleus, as one student told me I should call this course, the round purple nucleus course. So nice round uh, purple nucleus that's off to one end, and then they have that column type structure, so they're very long column like cells. And then at the very end, it's a little bit hard to see, but it, you have this brush border, and this little fringy brush border. That one here, it looks a little weird. That would be a destroyed cell, so that's one that's been squished out. And the chromatin, just to compare the two, so these are intact cells, and their cytoplasm's intact, really nice cells. Their nucleus has it's fairly dense in the chromatin, and then this guy is a squished cell. Its chromatin is a lot looser, and you can't really see the cytoplasm in the same way that you can the others. So here we've got bacteria and neutrophils. So seeing bacteria and neutrophils together is not normal. That's inflammation, definitely. So that would be septic degenerate purulent inflammation. Um, it looks like we've got macrophage kicking around here too. So normal in the, in the nasal passage, definitely it's normal to find some bacteria because again, that's what the nasal passage is partially for. It's to keep bacteria there and then back to the outside world as opposed to letting it go through the pulmonary system. But uh, we don't want to see inflammation. So these are really degenerated neutrophils and bacteria. So that would be an abnormal finding. And then fungal hyphae we can see as well. That's some stained up fungal hyphae and little fungal bodies with some inflammation. It's hard to tell which type of cells, but some uh, smushed up cells in the background. So again, fungal hyphae, we don't really want to see that. Not a normal finding. And this one in particular, Blastomyces. So this is a fungal-based um, microorganism that lives in the environment, and it's very common in the Georgian Bay area in Ontario. So it lives in the soil, typically around Georgian Bay, and it's dispersed naturally. It's just part of nature. But when dogs go rummaging in the bush, if they are sniffing something, if they're turning up the soil, then they can release these little spores from the soil. And that's blastomyces. And these little spores are so dangerous to dogs. So essentially, commonly what they get is a lung, sort of like a lung infection, but it's essentially like major inflammation in the lungs with blastomyces spreading and the lungs is sort of one of the I don't want to call it the best case scenario because dogs can really really go downhill fast but it tends to be recognized faster than some of the other forms of blastomyces when it gets into the body but essentially if you have a dog and it's been in that sort of central to northern Ontario area especially around Georgian Bay that's central Ontario and they have a cough, and you've tried the antibiotics that would normally kick kennel cough's butt, and you've tried the syrup, and it's not working, then start asking your vet about blastomyces, because it's way more common than I think people realize, and it can develop into major, major lung disease in these dogs, where they end up having to go down to referral and be on a respirator for sometimes weeks. I've heard of dogs been on respirators for weeks. So it's insane. The other way, it can also enter the body 
uh, once it gets into the body, sorry, so once it's breathed in, essentially, then it can migrate to the skin and cause pretty significant and severe skin lesions. And it can also get into the bones. So it's a really, really, really dangerous, dangerous, naturally occurring fungal form. So be aware of it. Blastomyces commonly shows up as a lung infection or lung disease. So here we've got a huge macrophage and it's gobbled up, so it's phagocytized these blastomyces. And then some newts in the background. Okay, they show up as a dark purple stain and they have this sort of dark purple aura. So around the edges, the dark purple really shows up well. There's a macrophage. And then lots of neutrophils. So this is a perfect example probably of either pyogranulomatous or purulent degenerate mycotic inflammation. Okay, so working our way down, we start to get to the lower respiratory tract. So pulmonary, we'll talk more so about. So indications for sampling uh, would be to identify inflammation, infection, allergies, neoplasia, foreign bodies. So sample collection and preparation is going to depend on what is suspected of that animal. And of course, what the owners are able to afford and take part in and what the clinic is able to offer or you know where they can refer the patient for that. So if you right click or just click on each of these highlighted, so the bronchoalveolar lavage, transtracheal wash, and bronchial brushings, if you click on those, not in this video but with the actual PowerPoint itself, then you can watch a couple of videos showing those particular procedures. They're pretty cool. And the goal of them is to acquire cytological samples. So we're essentially sending a fluid into either the bronchus or into the trachea and then taking that fluid back out to acquire the cells that cling to that fluid and get washed with that fluid. And then of course the bronchial brushings are physical brushings of the tissue to remove some of the cells, to exfoliate some of the cells. So this is a bronchoalveolar lavage and if you watch the video you'll see it as well, which I'd like you to watch the video if you're in my class. And transtracheal wash, which most often is done through the endotracheal tube while the animal is anesthetized. So again, there's bronchoalveolar lavage. And most often these patients are sedated for the bronchoalveolar lavage. Some of them are fully anesthetized. It's going to depend on the behavior of the patient itself, but most often sedation works quite well. And here's a horse getting bronchoalveolar lavage. So with a horse, we enter in through the, the nares. And you can see here we have a long tube connected to a syringe. And most often, what's well, in all cases, what's going to happen is a certain amount of saline is going to be flushed into the body. So into the pulmonary area, into the, or sorry, into the bronchi, and then withdrawn back out to acquire the fluid. So here's an example right here. So we've got this tube that's connected to a suction system. It's working its way in. I'm going to add fluid, flush it down into the bronchus. And then with the suction system, I'm going to suction that fluid right back out. So of course, it's hard to get all the fluid back out. But if it is sterile saline, that shouldn't be a problem to leave some in. It'll get resorbed into the body but we want to take most of the fluid back out so that we can yield a higher number of cells in our sample. Oops. So for these ones in particular, sample preparation, we're going to collect the sample for, if we're going to run it for cytology, we're going to collect it in an EDTA container. And we can't do a quantitative count since the extra fluid has been added. So either way, no matter what, because this is a wash to acquire a cytological sample, when we take that fluid back out, it's going to be heavily diluted, right? The cells themselves will be very diluted. So we can't really do a cytological count. We can do ratios, percentages of the cells that we're seeing. But just remember that it is a diluted sample. And then if we are, or if the doctor is concerned about sending it out for a culture and sensitivity, then we would put it in a red top tube. So a tube with no additives, sterile, of course, or any lab provided culture medium. 
and most often we just call the lab ahead of time and confirm what it is that they want us to send it out in. So then again, we're going to use the preparation or the smear techniques established. So based on the type of consistency of the sample, most of this will be really, really thin sample typically because it's so diluted. Although sometimes, like in that horse one, it was coming out quite white. So it depends what's going on with the animal. But most often it's going to be really diluted. So quite often we'll centrifuge it down and then perform a line smear to get an accumulation of cells in one particular area. Cytology. So expect to see ciliated and non-ciliated epithelials. The ciliated epithelial cells are more specific to the upper airways. So sometimes you can get contamination and get a few extra ciliated epithelial cells, but they are fairly specific to the upper airway. And then if it's an inflammatory sample, you'll get neutrophils, macrophages, eosinophils, and lymphocytes. And then always be on the lookout for mast cells because they definitely can exist in the lungs and they can also accumulate in the lungs in a mast cell tumor. And then note any red blood cells as well. You might also see epithelial cells displaying criteria of malignancy. So as we go on later in the lecture series, or it's going to be this week as well, but we're going to look at criteria of malignancy and what is it that we're looking for when we're reviewing criteria of malignancy. So again, it's looking for changes to cells that would indicate a problem with, pro with proliferation and with cell division and cell growth. So ciliated columnar epithelial cells, you might see some, again, more specific to the upper respiratory tract. So keep that categorized as a normal finding for the upper respiratory tract, more so. But you can see these guys, round purple nucleus, cytoplasm, and then they've got these fabulous ciliated brush borders. Squamous cells, common to see with bacteria now, or sorry, not common to see with bacteria. Um, this picture, of course, is, this would be contamination. So this picture is technically not from the pulmonary tract. I'll be very honest with you. This picture is definitely a squamous cell with Simonsiella, which is that normal oral bacteria there, that really big, um, they form big rods, but it's little rods of Simonsiella. And it has some cocci and it's got rods. So this would be more of a common finding in the mouth which sometimes, depending on how the sample is being taken, you might get contamination as it's passing through. But either way, this sample, because it's got uh, degenerate, um, degenerate neutrophils and heaps of bacteria, this would be an abnormal finding regardless. And you definitely want to note that. And inflammation in general would be an abnormal finding as well. So if you're seeing a lot of neutrophils, if you're seeing eosinophils, if you're seeing a lot of lymphocytes and plasma cells, macrophages, then definitely that would be an abnormal finding. So we've got some ciliated columnar epithelial cells, which again, you could see them in a bronchoalveolar lavage if the tube was passed through the nose. Not uncommon to collect some of those ciliated epithelial cells on the way down because they are specific to the upper respiratory tract. So they might end up showing up in your sample in that way. Here's a really nasty looking inflammation. So it looks like we've got some neutrophils, which actually don't, that one, like they don't look too, too terrible. This one looks really degenerate and that looks like a pycnotic neutrophil. So we've definitely got some neutrophils and then we have these beautiful macrophages. And these macrophages, remember I said that before, really common for respiratory system, or samples from the respiratory system. When the macrophages appear, they tend to look really frothy and they get really vacuolated. So this is, this is looking like a pyogranulomatous inflammation with majorly proteinaceous background. And then this one we've got eosinophils. So it looks like we've got some broken eosinophils and then an intact eosinophil. And then of course a macrophage and neutrophil. So that's very clearly eosinophilic inflammation and we wouldn't want to see this. It is common to see when a cat has asthma or when an animal in general has asthma. And then again, here's that blastomyces. So that little um, fungal form here with that really dark purple halo. And of course the macrophage and a lot of neutrophils kicking around. There's an eosinophil. 
So we wouldn't want to see that either. That's bad news bears. And this is common representation of blastomyces on radiograph. So you can see the whole lung field looks moth-eaten. So it looks all mottled in appearance between white and gray and white and gray. And then another, uh, just something out of interest, you'll notice that the stomach has a lot of uh, gas or air within the stomach. So animals that are in respiratory distress, it's really common to see their stomachs filled with air when we, when we take an x-ray, when we take a radiograph. The reason for that is they come in and they are often gasping for breath, they're breathing through their mouth, and they're just gulping at breaths, and they're gulping at breaths, and they're doing all that they can do to breathe. And in that, when they start breathing like that, then they always start swallowing air as well. So you can see a huge accumulation of air in the stomach. That's not their biggest problem. The biggest problem here is that lung field. It looks like um, a lot of moths got at it, so it's really bad news bears. So then while we're in the area, this particular area, so we're going to head into the mouth. Now the mouth is technically a feature, it's not technically a feature of the respiratory tract. We more so consider it with the digestive tract. But if we are performing any sort of cytological evaluation or we're concerned about breathing or anything like that, if we're in there, we're having a look, then we might want to look around for some abnormalities in the mouth. a little bit of anatomy, the tongue. This is what you see when you intubate an animal. So tongue, we've got the glottis, the larynx, vocal cords, and then our happy little trapdoor, the epiglottis. So indications, so we're shifting over a little bit. So reasons that we would sample the mouth. So we might want to look further into the mouth to see what's going on. And this, of course, would be directed by the doctor. So if an animal comes in and their mouth smells disgusting, that might be an indication that something's going on. I had a client call us the other night at work and say, my dog has death mouth <laughs> or no death breath. So yeah, yeah, definitely. If an animal comes in and they have death breath, it's probably a good idea to look inside the mouth and find out if something's going on. If there's any discharge, so any crusting at the side of the lips, or if there's active discharge coming out of the mouth, excessive drooling is always a good reason. So it could be bad teeth, could be an issue with teeth, but we also have to be concerned about masses because masses in the mouth, they'll disrupt the way the saliva flows or they'll disrupt the animal's ability to keep the saliva in their mouth. Difficulties eating, so if they take food in and drop it, or if they're only eating from one side of their mouth, or they're starting to eat very carefully. Painful patient, and sometimes a painful patient, we might just know them as a grumpy patient, and then whatever's causing them pain in their mouth, once it's removed or taken care of, they might become a happy patient. It's interesting, I've seen it happen. Changes in behavior, and excessive or unusual movements of their tongue. So when they kind of are licking and trying to clear something from their mouth, then that's an indication that the doctor would want to get inside the mouth, have a look, make sure there's no tumor masses or anything going on there. So the type of collection and preparation is going to depend on what it is that we're sampling. So if it's a mass, we might have, or the doctor might do a fine needle biopsy, or we might do it, or a fine needle aspirate biopsy with the punch biopsy. Swabs, same thing. Swabs might be useful, especially just the quick initial. Let's take a quick swab, see if anything abnormal is on it. Uh, but most often, you need to go a little bit deeper than that. This all may require anesthetic, depending on what needs to be done to the animal's mouth and the temperament of the animal. And then, of course, as always, we're going to use the smear technique that suits the type of sample that we've acquired. Common to see epithelial cells, so squamous cells, columnar cells, cuboidal cells, fibrocytes. So any fibrocytes, they're spindle cells. Essentially, they live underneath the epithelial layer in the mouth. So all that's telling us is if we have a whole bunch of fibrocytes in our sample or spindle cells in our sample, it means that we've gone deep, so deep into the tissue. Fibroblasts and then salivary gland epithelials, which are kind of interesting to see. And of course, bacteria. Bacteria is totally normal in the mouth. 
You may also see lymphocytes, so if the tonsils were part of the sample, so especially if the doctor is taking a sample of the soft palate at the back of the mouth or in the, um, in the pharynx, so in the throat itself, if they have gone through the pharynx and entered into the tonsils accidentally, that's when it's really common to see lymphocytes. And then, of course, inflammatory cells, not normal. We don't want to see it. And neoplastic cells as well. So we don't want to see these things. Now, it could be benign neoplasia or it could be malignant neoplasia. So these are spindle cells. These are fibrocytes. And they're just... <laughs> Piper. They're just round to oval purple nuclei, the way they stain with our stain here. And then really thinned out cytoplasm that just kind of wisp away on ends. An epulis technically is a form of benign neoplasia, so it's a growth of the, um, the gingiva. So that's an epulis, but again, it's always good to sample these, send it away, or do in-house cytology to make sure that it's nothing scarier than just an epulis. Because an epulis is benign, it might cause trouble with actually closing the mouth, or it might cause trouble with the tooth growth, but they are benign. So that's okay, it's not going to spread, it's not going to eat away at the bone. These are salivary cells, common to see, and they cut, they're just interesting little cells, again, purpley, nucleus, round to oval, and their cytoplasm just sort of essentially blends all into one. And then these are things you want to look out for. This is scary stuff. So this is squamous cell carcinoma, and this is definitely a malignant cancer, so malignant neoplasia. And we'll talk about looking at the criteria of malignancy um, when we get there. But you can see here you've got nuclear molding, so that's essentially, actually it could be even be, almost looks like there are three um, nuclei molded there, but changes to the nucleus. All these cells are the same type of cell, but they have variations in the size of the nucleus compared to the cytoplasm ratio, so this is not a happy sample. So overall, um, that was just how we sample for specific areas associated with the respiratory tract. Lots of different reasons. There's a lot of cancers that affect the respiratory tract. There's a lot of fungal material that could do that. Inflammation, bacteria, benign tumors, asthma. There's a whole bunch of medical illnesses that can cause challenges and troubles to the respiratory tract. So it's important that the doctor know how to sample it and is able to tell us which type of sampling they'd like. And then of course we prepare the samples and review the findings. So swelling in general can be caused by inflammation, infection, neoplasia, non-neoplastic, non-inflammatory lesions. Anytime the doctor's not sure where it's coming from, it's best to investigate what not to do. Boom, throw a pair of sunnies on it. That's it, that's all.